differently. So water is, is, why are we primarily water? Because it's the medium in which all of the enzyme and chemical reactions in the body occur. Um, it's important for movement, movement of nutrients, hormones, antibodies, oxygen, um, all of these things through the bloodstream and the lymphatic system. Um, even more important than this is that it serves as a conductor of the electrical signals that are being sent in the space around your cells that is completely dependent on the proper mineral balance. So if you get too much water in your body, you get edema. Too little water, you're going to get dehydration. Um, but again, as you can see, there are many, many functions that absolutely require water um, in order to get the message out there. And which is why a raw diet is so beautiful, Dr. Klein, because if you look at what the water content in a raw diet is, um, it is, you know, 75% water. So, or moisture, let's say that, moisture. And mm -hmm. that does move everything through the body as you're talking about. So many people will, even vets will say, well, I don't want you on a raw diet because it's too high in protein. But let's get something straight. <laughs> That, that's just not necessarily true. And why would you want a dry, um, so the, 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 the thing that we're talking about here is bioavailable, great protein, high quality protein, plus very high in moisture, the raw diet. So it moves that stuff right through the body instead of sucking out all the hydration of your organs. And you see this because many people will say, what's the matter with my dog? They're not drinking as much water. Yeah. So they're eating a raw diet and they're getting a lot of moisture in their food. Absolutely, absolutely. So all of this information as we move on to the genome, um, why, so now you know about nutrients. Now what we're going to do is talk about how does that apply in your dog. I'm going to understanding, again, very basic science here about what makes your dog a carnivore. This is the fuel, people, for when your veterinarian starts to give you a hard time. So on the slide you can see what we've discovered is that the dog is made up of approximately 20,000 genes. Of this, less than 1% of those genes determines physical appearance, but you'll also see that it's only 50 genes that actually determine a breed's defining physical characteristics. So if you, um, one of the one of the fun statistics I found in my nutrigenomics lecture, there is only a one gene difference between a dachshund and a Rottweiler. So again, one out of 20,000 genes. So that 1% piece is important because again, when your veterinarian says your dog is not a wolf, you say, well, that's only 1% of his DNA. The rest of that 99% is the DNA that your body uses in order to function every day. So when we talk the word genomics, what this means is you turn on a gene to do a job. So if you're turning on a gene in your muscle cell, you're making your muscle move you down the path. Um, when you're done moving down the path, you want to turn that gene off and say, hey, I don't need that function anymore. So playing with this genetic expression piece um, is where a lot of the current research is, especially in cancer therapies, et cetera. Um, but the importance when, when there's that big word, nutrigenomics, throw that one at your veterinarian. How do you use food to influence optimal DNA expression? First and foremost, you start with a diet that actually, um, that the, the DNA of the body actually A came from and B recognizes. Awesome. So true. So true. So let's talk about the taxonomy of the dog and cat. You know, so when people say, you know, well, my dog, uh, you know, is fine on kibble. Well, I mean, they may, they may live on kibble, but, you know, the truth of the matter is cats, even more so than dogs, are carnivores. That means they eat meat. Correct. And, you know, the thing is, I mean, this is the part, too, that adaptation, um, our bodies are hardwired for survival. And the worst things in the world can happen to you and you still dust yourself up and you get off on the couch every day and you go out there naked and afraid. You somehow make it through whatever crisis that your body needs you to get through um, on a very instinctual or unconscious level. So this concept that, oh, my dog's, my dog's doing fine on kibble, your dog is surviving on kibble, because the biological, according to their DNA, biological lifetimes of a dog is 20 years, of a cat is 30 years. So when I'm hearing statistics like 
66% cancer rate in dogs by the age of 10, that is a huge red flag to me that, boy, something that we're doing is not right. Because that's the same as if we extrapolate to people, that means that two-thirds of us, by the time we're 50 years of age, are going to have cancer. Um, why there isn't a greater uproar in uh, the pet caring population over that statistic uh, is probably related to the fear-mongering made um, done by the pet food companies. Because as you look at the little chart next to, so the taxonomy, this is basic biology, people. According to the biological classifications of all things that walk the earth, you will see that both your dog and your cat are carnivores. And when you look here to the nutrient content comparison chart, as we're talking protein, fat, and carbohydrates, uh, these are averages. So we're looking at an ancestral diet that is you know, two to three times more protein than what you're gonna find in a dry dog food. Again, remember, it does not mean it's meat protein. So you gotta look at that 18% and say, all right, well, if it's primarily lentils, then my dog's not really getting the meat protein that he needs. Um, the fat, we'll touch on that a little bit here. Um, but here again, look at our carbohydrate difference, people. 46 to 74% in a dry dog food, where the ancestral diet, again, 14%. Um, the, it's not so important about the numbers, but just look at the disparity between what nature designed our bodies to eat and what Big Fuda has convinced you is an acceptable diet. So all of the studies that um, I primarily looked at with regards to the research that I was putting out there, um, bear with me, I'm looking, oh, diet selection studies is where I got my research from. And what does that mean? That means that you put out a variety of protein, fat, carbohydrate-based foods, um, and you just, you let the animals decide which ones they like and which ones they do best on. Um, and in two or three different studies that took that approach, the averages were 30% protein for our um, carnivores, 63% fat, and 7% carbohydrates. Keep in mind the word average. So I like to just round everything out and say 30, 60, 10, uh, dog or cat. I was taught in school that cats needed more fat. Um, these diets, actually, these studies show that that's not really the truth. They did not want more fat than dogs. Um, and protein contents and stuff. They're all basically the same. And the other part to, to keep in mind here too, that this also is the same percentages that they're advocating for people on a ketogenic diet. Um, and that is because on our next slide, as we talk about uh, how do we all break ourselves down here, this again is something when your veterinarians are giving you a hard time, Didi touched on this a little bit before, um, your, your classification is determined by your teeth. So carnivores, again, have long fang teeth. They have a hinge jaw, which just means that they can chomp on things. They do not grind. The significance of being able to grind is because those animals, our herbivores, can actually do things like root vegetables. A carnivore who can't chew um, absolutely cannot digest a sweet potato, a potato, a beet, or a carrot. And I hear all the time, oh, but Fluffy loves carrots. Well, of course Fluffy. Mm -hmm loves carrots, they're high in sugar. So the concept here is a carnivore, again, optimal feeding. Um, only things that grow above the ground are typically the stuff that they're going to eat. Uh, root vegetables lead to an overgrowth of candida in the um, intestinal system, which is one of the leading causes of leaky gut and a whole plethora of symptoms uh, as far as brain fog, weight gain, leads to a bunch of chronic diseases as well. So um, I encourage people to remember that your carnivore um, is not a vegan. Your carnivore cannot do root vegetables and your carnivore is gonna do best on a biologically appropriate diet um, as we've already kind of described. And to that point of, you know, my dog loves this kibble, okay, because I hear that sometimes, and I want to say, well, I'm, I'm certain, I'm certain that I addition. would like, right, I'm certain that I would like crack too, but I'm probably not going to try it, um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, or meth, or whatever, but they do get addicted, so it's it's no different than a sugar addiction in a child, a sugar addiction in my husband. Um, they're addicted to the sugar because this goes into the physiology piece. Remember how we talked about you eat a meal, the sugar goes up, your cortisol and your insulin stuff starts to, uh, to get engaged here. So you start riding this roller coaster ride, sugar goes up, your body brings it down. Now I'm hungry. Now it goes back up again. Now it comes down. So these animals who it's like, 
they, they hit the ball and people say, oh my God, he inhaled his meal. That's because there's nothing in there that gives them a sense of satisfaction that only comes from fat. And because they're on this crazy sugar high, sugar low, they're, they're constantly hungry and the body's constantly trying to find sources of fuel. So those are the dogs that get in the trash, the ones that counter surf, the ones that eat the furniture. Those dogs, if it's, if it's anxiety, that might be driven by low blood sugar, but it's also these animals are hungry. 